Welcome, everybody. We'll get started in just a few moments. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome, everybody. We'll just get started in a few moments as I see more people are joining us. Okay, well, hello, my name is Tamar Friedman and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, More Paths for More People, Opportunities and Barriers to Becoming a Jewish Educator, which is the first of a three-part series in partnership with CASG, the Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education, that gives us the opportunity to really dive into the findings in their recent study on career trajectories of Jewish educators, key findings for the funding community. I want to make a special thank you to the Jim Joseph Foundation and the William Davidson Foundation, who um, were very much a partner in this study and funded this study. And thank you for their thought partnership in all of these webinars as well. And today we're going to hear from Manny Menchel, Senior Program Officer, Jewish Life, William Davidson Foundation, Ariel Levitas, uh, Managing Director of CASG, and Alex Pompson, Principal and Managing Director of Rossov Consulting. And with that, I want to hand it over to Manny to get us started today with some more framing remarks and intro introducing our other speakers. Thank you, Manny. Pleasure. And thank you, Tamar. Really, thanks to you and to your team and colleagues at the Jewish Funders Network for your interest in this topic. Um, it's certainly a, a dear topic to my heart um, and no doubt to the William Davidson Foundation and the Jim Joseph Foundation. Um, just before I start, I want to invite those of you here. I can't see you right now, but I trust you can see me and hear me or hear me um, to take a moment and type in the chat something that you're hoping to learn or multiple ideas uh, in relation to this uh, study around career trajectories of Jewish educators. Today, we're going to be talking about more paths for more people. Um, but broadly, what you're thinking about, what exactly are you hoping to glean from this research, um, and specifically uh, with our wonderful um, educators, researchers, and presenters today, Drs. Aria Levitas and Alex Pomson. So just a personal anecdote, what brought me to this conversation, um, and perhaps orient, how I orient uh, around the research? Um, I grew up in the home of Jewish educators. Both of my parents um, work at Jewish day schools. Um, and my father, every year for, for the last good number of years, it's springtime, he calls me invariably and says, Manach, um, do you know any good educators? We're, we're short uh, for this spot in this classroom and this spot for this classroom. Who do you know? How can you help me? And I paused and reflected on what a question from a large leading Jewish day school in New York City facing that kind of an annual challenge might mean for the broader uh, field of Jewish education and specifically in my interests in supporting the local Detroit Jewish community. Wh what does it mean if the largest Jewish community in the country struggles with its market of Jewish educators, what does that mean for Detroit? And um, kind of took the opportunity to informally inquire locally among colleagues and leaders in Detroit and kind of observe what the state of Jewish education and specifically Jewish educational talent is in Detroit. Um, right around that time, started having some conversations with our friends at the Jim Joseph Foundation uh, specifically Stacy Turner um, and our friends at, at, at CASG, Rosav Consulting, Alex and Wendy Rosav. And um, we, we understood that this anecdotal issue that I noticed and am curious about was something we were all thinking about and it, you know relating to in different ways. Um, and of course, the concern for training Jewish educators is nothing new for the William Davidson Foundation. Um, we have inherited at the William Davidson Foundation an incredible legacy 
of investing in the development of and sustaining great Jewish educators uh, from our partnerships with the Wexner Foundation, um, the uh, Wexner Graduate Fellowship and Davidson Scholars Program, and our, our investment at the Jewish Theological Seminary with the William Davidson Graduate School of Jewish Education, many different investments over the years and some with, with national acclaim. Um, and of course, I, I, I'm reminded of uh, my onboard at the William Davidson Foundation nearly five years ago when I uh, was introduced to Mr. Davidson, to William Davidson, through a set of videos in our archives. Um, and one of those videos really struck me because um, in it, he was asked why he invests in the development of Jewish educators. And he said very simply, he offered perhaps a theory of change of sorts where he said, I care about Jewish continuity. Jewish continuity requires strong Jewish community. Strong Jewish community requires good education, compelling Jewish education, and Jewish education cannot be compelling without great Jewish educators. And that was it. It was very simple. Um, and, um, and so here we are. This has been a few years in the making. And I'm going to really hand it off. And, and we're all here to learn from um, Ariel and from Alex and, and the incredible work that, that you, the two of you have done with your teams and colleagues and just feel very grateful um, to be at this moment. Um, and I, got, I wanna just frame it with two simple questions. One, what is the state of the Jewish educational workforce in North America today? That's a simple question. Um, and two, what can research tell us about critical needs and possible responses? I, I look at today's attendees and I know there is such a wide and, and deep um, interest, um, stakeholding interest in these questions. And we're really uh, thrilled uh, to learn from you today. Thank you, Manny. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Tamar, if you don't mind, we, I, I hope you, you won't object. We're going to subject you to a few PowerPoint uh, slides. Uh, hopefully, uh, it won't be uh, too onerous. Uh, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ariel Avidas. I'm the Managing Director of CASG, the Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education. And our mission at CASG is to improve the quality of knowledge that can guide Jewish education practice and policy. Um, and so I'm co-presenting here today um, with uh, the wonderful Dr. Alex Thompson from Rusov Consulting. And we're gonna be sharing some key findings from the recent career trajectory study as relates specifically to issues of educator recruitment. So recruitment of Jewish educators. Um, and it's just wonderful to be here, have Manny serve as host of this presentation. All right, next slide, thank you. So I do wanna take a minute before we delve in more specifically to issues of recruitment uh, to give you a balcony view of the larger study. So the Career Trajectory Study is a larger scale multi-strand program of research it was designed through a signature process at CASG, whereby we bring together researchers, practitioners, funders, and other stakeholders in Jewish education to generate a set of pressing questions uh, for which more knowledge could reasonably uh, lead to the capacity to make better decisions and fuel improvements in Jewish education. So this particular meeting was focused very broadly on questions pertaining to the recruitment, the retention, and the development of Jewish educators. And an important principle in CASG's work is that research questions are always informed by the concerns of people in the field, on the ground, and what they say they need to know. And we maintain these relationships with practitioner leaders throughout the research cycle. So drafts of the reports and briefs um, from which we'll be sharing over the course um, of these next uh, couple webinars, they were all read by groups of practitioner leaders and policymakers. They engaged with the data with us, they asked questions, they shared their ideas about implications, and their input shaped the final form that these reports took. And um, these collaborative conversations are still ongoing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, later in our program. Uh, and then in addition to um, input from practitioner leaders in this larger study, we were also guided 
by a technical advisory committee made up of scholars in general education and Jewish education. Um, a very impressive group um, uh, that includes, I, I like to brag, four members of the National Academy of Education. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Tamar. So unlike previous studies of the Jewish education workforce, of which there have been um, a few, the most recent probably was Aegis that was, um, it's over 10 years old. Um, so uh, this study takes a broader view of who a Jewish educator is. So for the purposes of this study, um, our working definition included individuals post-college age, working for pay, part-time or full-time, working directly with people who identify as Jews in some way, all ages, in a wide range of settings, but in programs that exist to help participants find meaning in Jewish texts, experiences, and community. Um, so I think hopefully we all know that Jewish education takes place in many kinds of settings, inside, outdoors, increasingly online. Um, and so for the purposes of this study, we kind of binned um, all these various um, venues into five sectors. Um, so uh, the first we call formal Jewish education. So this includes, for example, early childhood, uh, supplemental or part-time schooling and day schools. Um, sector two, which we call informal or experiential. Um, so that includes youth groups, camps, campus work, um, JCCs. Then we have sector three, engagement, social justice, and innovation. This includes organizations such as Repair the World, Moisha House, One Table. Sector four, these are Jewish educators housed in communal organizations. So that could be federations, Jewish family services, JCRCs um, as examples. And then finally, the fifth sector, um, which are the non-organizational networks uh, and online learning. So these are independent tutors and fully online education platforms, for example, uh, Shalom Learning. Um, uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so before we dig into the data, I do want to just take a step back and just sort of ask, why does our topic of conversation, the recruitment of Jewish educators, matter at all? And I feel like I always have to begin by emphasizing that in general education research, teacher quality is the number one most important school-based determinant of student outcome. From everything that we know reasonably, right? Teachers and teacher quality matters. Teachers make a difference. Um, but broadly in the US today, we are facing a teacher shortage, okay? So this includes in general education, the number of individuals seeking a degree in education in the US has been dropping steadily since 2009, and the effects of COVID-19 um, are, uh, are, are not looking promising, at least. Um, and when we look at the educational requirements, the investment necessary to launch a career in teaching um, alongside associated pay level, prestige, and compare that to other career opportunities for professionals in the US, there has long been an imbalance in the United States. Um, and concurrently, um, there are some gender-based issues as well. Um, teaching in the U.S. has at least for about 150 years been primarily a female-based uh, occupation. And women went into teaching as a kind of respectable career that offered them a secure position in the American middle class. Um, and now a lot of women see other professional um, opportunities and choices for themselves. And we do see these patterns echoed in Jewish education as well. So when we look at the Jewish education labor market by sector and venue, we do see variability as far as supply and demand. And so this slide here is really giving us a snapshot um, of recruitment challenges as faced by um, various venues and sectors in the Jewish education field, right? Um, what we found as part of this larger study and the mapping the market strand is that different sectors of Jewish education are in a sense serviced by different pipelines with um, varying pressures related to filling the roster of positions for educators. Um, it's a particularly pressing challenge to find talent to staff supplemental schools 
um, which is really to the best of our knowledge. Um, and we're hoping to uh, publish an estimate on that soon, but to the best of our knowledge, that's where most um, Jewish kids in the US are getting a Jewish education today, right? And there are real staffing challenges there. Um, we also see staffing challenges faced by leaders in day schools and early childhood campus education. You know, they do struggle with finding the right talent. Um, and as I understand it, you know, I will have to look at what this summer's uh, numbers reveal, but even camping, you know, which has um, sort of had an easier time than some of the other sectors, even camping has been facing new recruitment challenges in the COVID era. And studies in general education have shown that the teacher labor market can be responsive to market conditions and targeted interventions, right? There are things one can do to make teaching a more appealing profession. So whether we have the capacity or the will to do those things as a Jewish community is certainly another question, but um, the career trajectory study helps us understand various pushes and pulls that draw people in or deter them from a career in Jewish education. So I'm going to turn things over now to Alex Thompson um, and uh, go, take it away, Alex, to tell us a little thank bit you. more about recruitment. Thank you, Ariel, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Tomorrow, if we can look at the next slide, please. So um, in based on our review of literature that explores career trajectories in general, um, we developed a concept of the ways or the pathway into the field of Jewish education. And this is a case where a picture, if a picture is worth a thousand words, there are about 10,000 words that probably try and convey what's on this, uh, on this graphic. Essentially, our concept here is that right at the top of the screen there, uh, most folks who come into the field of Jewish education start out in what we characterize as seed sectors. Think of these as uh, camps or um, working as a, an Israel trip um, counselor or a, an NCSY advisor. Most of the people who participate in those sectors do not become Jewish educators, but a disproportionate number of people who do become Jewish educators begin in those places. And when they, or if they begin with some appetite to become a Jewish educator or they're curious about it, many of them move on to a next step in this kind of path into what we call enabling opportunities. And these are structured environments specifically intended to prepare people to enter the field, most classically, a graduate degree in Jewish education, right? And the goal of these programs is to propel people forward. You'll see there's a little doorway there, and some people decide after participating in these experiences that they want no more, all well and good. But most of the folks who participate in those enabling opportunities do continue into uh, a job, work in the field of Jewish education. But what's critical to notice here is that that's not the end of the funnel because about half of those who start work as Jewish educators decide to leave the field within the first five years. So really to, to say that someone is committing their life or committing a fair part of their career to Jewish education is a further step in this process. Now, what is it that drives people forward and what is it that might leave them to exit through those doors? Well, we imagined it's about the interplay between two sets of forces. First of all, on the left-hand side, what we call personal assets, those resources, cultural, social, even financial resources that enable people to move forward, certain stimuli, and we'll talk about what those may be in a minute, that inspire people, that encourage people to move forward. And those are in interaction with inhibitors, factors that draw, drive people away. Uh, they discover that work-life balance is just too challenging here. There aren't work opportunities where they are situated. They can't uh, live off the salary that's available. Those are inhibitors that push people away. And so our study was intended to unpack the degree to which this concept truly plays out and to identify, and this is responding to something that was in the chat box, um, the extent to which interventions might make a difference in advancing people from one level of this funnel to another. So that's really the story 
uh, we're exploring here. So if we can go to the next slide, share with you something about the composition of the sample that we were looking at here. So way back in that seed sector, there were folks who do become Jewish educators, some who become Jewish educators and then leave, and a majority who never became Jewish educators. And I suppose like one of the most original aspects of this study in trying to understand what, what causes people to enter the field and what causes some people not to enter the field was to actually go back and survey people who were coming out of those seed sectors. We wanted to understand, um, or we wanted to try and learn about those who never became Jewish educators. Was, it, was there ever a possibility that they might have done so? And we also wanted to connect with people who did dip their foot in the water. They began work in the field, but then left and now don't plan to come back. And then of course, we've got people who are in their first five years of the field um, and who are committed to remaining there. And perhaps what's striking here about our sample is you'll see that the minority of people in our sample, just a quarter of the sample, are people who are committed to remaining. And this is really helpful in terms of understanding what's drawing people in and more importantly, what's causing people to leave. And, and last but not least, something that really has, really has received hardly any attention, if, um, if at all, and that is, what, can we know, what do we know about the people who started out in these places from which many Jewish educators come? How do they feel about Jewish education? And to what extent might they be allies and fellow travelers for those who do commit to a career in Jewish education? So this is a sample we're looking at. And much of the data going to share, that I'm going to share now really compares the responses of these three populations, the ones who have remained and plan to stay, those who started out and left, and those who never became Jewish educators. Uh, next slide, please. Before we get to that data, to give you a quick snapshot of who has, who is entering the field today. Remember, this is data about people who are no further than five years into the work. So some of these people may still leave. What we know is um, there are certain formative experiences that a high proportions of them have had. Overnight camp, participating in a youth group and a group trip to Israel. You may say, well, what about day school education? Well, that was just below the 60% group trip to Israel. It was over half of the sample, I seem to remember but it's not quite as many as uh, those other three sectors. Our population is not surprisingly relatively young since these are people who have been in the field for less than five years. We've got nearly three quarters who are in their twenties. Um, the mix of uh, females, those who identify as women and men is perhaps uh, not surprising, but actually it is surprising in that this sample shows a third of our population uh, are men. And uh, when we compare these data with those who have remained in the field, another part of our study that looked at people who've been in the field for longer than five years, we find that the proportion of men is, is even smaller. Right now, there may just be a generational difference here, or there may, what we may be seeing here is a higher proportion of men who start out and then drop out, or then leave, I should say. Um, that's, that's a question that, uh, to which we don't necessarily have the answer. Socioeconomically, you can see that uh, most of those who have entered in the field are relatively comfortable uh, or come from relatively comfortable backgrounds, I should say, um, in uh, financial terms. And lastly, in terms of denomination, the denominational mix certainly doesn't reflect the total Jewish population, uh, according to Pew, uh, but it does, uh, we feel, very much reflect what we see in the field more generally, with about a quarter of the population uh, identifying as orthodox, conservative reform in, in fairly uh, equal numbers, basically. So this is a, a, a really a, um, a 10,000 foot snapshot of who is currently in the early stage of uh, a working career in Jewish education. Now let's look at some distinguishing characteristics of it's these folks. Awesome. Sure. We just we just have one. We have a question for clarity. Um, sure. Rabbi Eli Confer asked to be clear. Twenty seven percent of the educators surveyed are Orthodox. Did the survey include Haredi institutions 
Or does this really mean modern Orthodox and to the left, or Haredi instead? educators in non-Haredi institutions? Uh, great question. We, do, we did gather, I suppose, the most explicitly furthest right of the samples we gathered were we were working with NCSY, which you would probably still classify as modern orthodox. We we're able to say from our sample that we did pick up about 5% Haredi educators. We did try and recruit participants from Haredi programs that are preparing educators to enter the field. And unfortunately, they uh, didn't want to participate in the study. Thanks. And, and one more question, just to clarify, how did the uh, study define socioeconomic status, low to moderate to high? Uh, it, was, it was basically self-report. We were asking people about the extent to which uh, their families uh, were able to live comfortably in the families in which they were raised the extent to which there seemed to be just enough money to cover expenses, and the extent to which uh, the family was dependent on subsidies and other factors. And, and so this is, we, we didn't ask people about the incomes of their parents, it's really very much about a sense of family income. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next slide then. Uh, and so let's, let's take a look at, at patterns that might indicate something about uh, who came to enter the field and who didn't. So first of all, let's talk about um, formative experiences as, uh, as young adults or as children. And um, what's striking about these data is that, uh, let me call out what we're looking at here. The pink columns are, those, uh, are the responses of those who are currently Jewish educators and plan to stay. The green column, the one in the middle, represents those who have been Jewish educators but do not plan to come back. And the blue are those folks who never were Jewish educators. And when you look at these uh, elements that might have contributed to a pathway into the field, what is striking is that those who became Jewish educators don't differ to such a large degree from those who never did or those who were for some time and, and then left the field. Um, the differences are most significant um, in the, in the middle there, if they had Jewish educator role models, right? Uh, to a lesser degree, if they had a close connection with uh, clergy members. And, uh, and there it is. Um, uh, when you look at whether they had inspiring Jewish teachers or whether they had mediocre Jewish teachers, we don't find statistically significant differences between the different populations. And the, the issue of whether they were exposed to others who were engaged in Jewish learning, well, interestingly, those who never became Jewish educators were actually exposed to a slightly greater degree than those who did. So it, it's difficult to, to pinpoint or to say that uh, the driver in terms of who is coming into the field is so much about specific biographical experiences in uh, childhood or in one's early years. What is much more, uh, distinct, if we can look at the next slide, please, is in terms of um, what people report as their Jew the extent of their Jewish knowledge. Now, we don't know for sure. We ask people about their, the extent of their Jewish knowledge today, and some of that knowledge may have been acquired since they left, uh, since they came into the field. But based on our interviews with people, we get a very strong sense that what people are telling us is a story that goes back quite far, and that there are uh, statistically significant differences between those who are current educators and the other populations. This may not look great on the screen, the, the numbers look small, but in real uh, statistical terms, these, these, add, these, these represent meaningful differences. First of all, they start out with uh, significantly higher levels of Jewish knowledge and significantly higher levels of Hebrew knowledge. The Hebrew knowledge is not so high. Most, most aspects of Jewish education don't require high levels of Hebrew knowledge. But starting out with or coming to this field with a reasonably high level of Jewish knowledge seems to be an important threshold. And we certainly, when, we, when interviewing people, we heard from those who felt they simply didn't know enough in order to come into the field. That really does seem to be a, a fork in the road. How much people uh, how much, how intensive a Jewish education they experienced in their earlier years, 
or the extent to which they had access to what we called Jewish cultural uh, capital. Okay, that's an important distinction. And if we move to the next slide, we see some really striking differences between those who plan to remain and those who uh, started out but left uh, and those who never came at all. And this is really in terms of mission, a sense of mission. We characterize this, these are, these are constructs that each of which is made up of different, um, different uh, items. So personal Jewish mission includes items such as, I wanna make a difference to the Jewish people. Uh, I wanna do something meaningful for the Jewish people. Um, personal Jewish mission, we see a really a, a strong, uh, we see a striking uh, significant difference between the current Jewish educators and the other two populations. Likewise, into people's appetite and interest in Jewish growth. And then finally, their love of Jewish learning. And I should say this, this construct doesn't only uh, include an item about uh, their own love of Jewish learning, but it's also about their desire to share that learning with others. And what I want to highlight is that our interviews indicate that um, a center mission is not all or nothing. It is not something you have and that propels you into the field. We learned that there are a great many people in another part of our study, we learned that about 50% of those who start out in the field of Jewish education came into the field because they say a job was available. And many of those people um, are ignited uh, if that doesn't sound too terrible, but they are um, inspired by their work to develop a sense of mission. Mission grows with time. And it is this sense of mission that really seems to propel people forward. And it's a strong sense of Jewish mission, but it isn't only Jewish. And let me just take you to the next slide if possible. It is part of a larger sense of calling. And it is here where some of the differences are really striking is that those who um, are current Jewish educators and plan to stay really are uh, propelled by a desire to make a difference to the lives of others. Um, quite different from people who work in other professions. Um, uh, and to some extent, what's really interesting here is they also wanna do good for themselves. They wanna to contribute to themselves, but they wanna grow and at the same time, contribute to others. Now, the, the key question here is where does, you know, can one do more to inspire such things? And we will talk about, uh, talk about short, talk about that shortly. But what we want to talk about next, we're going to hand over to Ariel in a second, is why um, being fueled by this sense of calling is so important when one takes a look at um, some of the conditions in which people find themselves working. So I'm going to hand over to Ariel now. Thank you. Can we get out of the next slide? And turn on. Okay, here we are. Um, okay, so now we're going to sort of look at the opposite side of the coin, right? If there were some of the things that were fueling commitments, um, at least amongst those who um, are the current Jewish educators. Now we're going to look at some of the inhibitors. Um, so by inhibitors, we mean those circumstances, um, the pressures, that may be discouraging individuals from working um, in the field of Jewish education or from even, you know, testing out a career in Jewish education. Um, so I, when we look at this slide, right, and so the current Jewish educators are the pink on the left, um, the green is our path that have left, and then the blue are the never Jewish educators. Um, sort of what we see is that current educators have so have, have a lower sensitivity to these inhibitors compared to the past and uh, never Jewish educator. So the, they rate these inhibitors overall as less likely to influence them to change a career, right? So they report being less influenced by unsupportive working environments, uh, by lower job status compared to other professional fields. Uh, they are less um, uh, discouraged by what we call the parochial context of Jewish educational settings. So working for and with the Jewish community instead of a wider population. Um, 
Although on this last factor over here uh, on the right, we don't really see a significant difference. Um, as a personal fit, we don't see a difference between these three analytic populations. And then uh, if we move to the next slide. Okay, so um, this slide probes a little more directly at the perceptions of respondents of what it's like to work in the field of Jewish education in particular. So I think here, um, if we take a step back at the slide and just kind of look at the overall pattern, right, it seems that all the analytic groups agree, right, that working in uh, Jewish education provides a larger sense of purpose. It's a career that is high on meaning making. But then um, if we look at benefits, right, which is the, those um, columns all the way to the left, uh, not doing so well, not so much. Um, right, so here again, we have variability in terms of how Jewish educators versus others rate the field on these facets, right? So on some factors, Jewish educators are a little more optimistic um, in their assessments, and on some, they're actually a little more pessimistic um, about what working in the field is like. So what this slide demonstrates overall is that early career Jewish educators don't have a rose-eyed point of view on their chosen field, right? They're not totally naive. They do understand um, that there are challenges that a career in Jewish education poses, yet they, they are more persistent and they persevere in pursuing that career anyway. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm not gonna read aloud the quote, so I invite you to read them. Um, but so I just want to call attention here, and uh, we're not going to have time to get into it too deeply, but right, there are different kinds of inhibitors. Um, what we call in the report the structural versus the circumstantial. So structural inhibitors are those that um, reflect bigger, overarching, more systemic problems, right? They reflect a larger shared cultural attitude. Um, and they're unlikely to change too much necessarily, although not always, but unlikely to change too much from workplace to workplace. So lower salaries compared to other professions, uh, concerns about prestige of the profession. But we also have what we call circumstantial inhibitors that um, very much have to do with a particular institution and the particular circumstances there. So having encountered a toxic work environment. Um, and so these inhibitors lend themselves to different kinds of solutions and interventions. Um, next slide. Okay, so this slide outlines the four primary pathways that emerged when we looked at um, people who were high potential for launching a career in Jewish education. Um, so we have fellow travelers, and Alex um, uh, touched on that earlier, right? These are people with high potential for launching a career. They staffed summer camp. Uh, they worked uh, for a few years after college, maybe in the field, and they have very positive memories overall of their work in Jewish education. They think highly of the field, and they uh, collectively form a possible sort of untapped well of champions and supporters for the field of Jewish education. We have those um, that we call looking for a map, okay? So these respondents actually had an interest in a career in Jewish education, these um, participants. They had though a limited perspective on the kinds of careers that they might have in the field and the kinds of settings in which Jewish educators work, okay? So they kind of wrote themselves out of a career in Jewish education because they had limited knowledge of the breadth of the field uh, and possibly if they knew or understood more about the varied kinds of settings and roles a Jewish educator uh, might work in, they may have launched a career. We have those um, who we call turn, they turned around on the highway. And this was 40% of the analytic sample, by the way, right? They started a career and then they left, okay? And for some, that's the right choice because teaching certainly isn't for everyone. Um, but for many more with, with support, they may have stayed and they may have been in a position to make a positive contribution to the field of Jewish education. And 40% is a high number. Um, in general education, sort of we usually think that about 17 to 30%. And even in general education, it's hard to get good sound numbers, right? But 17 to 30% of new teachers leave in the first five years, um, just as a comparative point. 
and then um, equipped for the journey. These are those uh, have successfully launched their career. And importantly, um, many who are starting out have launched a career in Jewish education. They do credit um, their entry into the field to an enabling opportunity, some kind of intensive pre-service program that gave them foundational knowledge, skills, a network of support they needed to persevere in the face of some of those inhibitors. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. Next slide. Okay, so this is just sort of a quick statistical synopsis. Um, so using a regression analysis, what characteristics predict, you know, that, uh, uh, that someone who is enrolled in one of these intensive experiences, right? Um, so from an already fairly highly engaged population with some expressed interest in Jewish learning and communal life, what characteristics predict that someone will ultimately be a Jewish educator? Um, and so these are some of the topics that we touched on earlier, role models who are Jewish education, looking for meaning, love the subject matter, want to make a contribution to others. But even here we have there, they know actually that there's a poor work life balance, they have some perception of that in Jewish education. And then the next slide. Okay, so again, the other side of the, the coin, what predicts statistically never being a Jewish educator. We have, we didn't get a chance to talk about all of these, um, but um, again, we have these ideas about um, some of the poor um, workplace conditions um, and just some different ideas about what they're looking for in a career. But again, we do see that they were, you know, around people who were engaged in Jewish learning. Uh, and interestingly, uh, having not participated in an enabling opportunity predicts never being a Jewish educator as well. Okay, so Alex, I'm gonna turn it back to you um, before we go to q and Thank you. Right, just a couple more slides here. Uh, first of all, to really hone in on uh, the phenomenon of enabling opportunities. I think one of, the, one of the most important findings in the preparing for entry strand of our work was uh, ex seeing the, the contribution of uh, these frameworks, which we characterize as enabling opportunities, structured frameworks that are specifically designed to prepare and intensify people's interest in uh, uh, working in this field. What we learned was that uh, of those who are current Jewish educators, just under half, as you can see there, uh, participated in a, an experience of that kind. Among those who uh, started out but left the field, just a quarter did so, and far fewer, not surprisingly, among those who never became Jewish educators, just, just over 10% participated in those experiences. Not surprisingly, because the experiences really are designed for folks who uh, have a high level of interest in coming into the field. And uh, based on an analysis of uh, those who participate in enabling opportunities, we learned that they, um, uh, they're characterized by, uh, characterized by a number of things, that they're looking for personal meaning in their work and they see Jewish education as contributing to society. A number of factors that, that you can see there. Now, what's important to emphasize is that based on, you know, we conducted maybe, uh, we conducted 50 interviews with folks from, from the three populations that we're looking at here. And what we learned about these enabling opportunities is that their contribution is really threefold they build people's skills, their professional skills and their capacity to be able to do the work, not surprisingly. They also build people's cultural capital, their knowledge of the content. That's another factor that clearly, as I said earlier, a kind of threshold factor. And last but not least, they also build people's social capital, their networks of relationships with fellow Jewish educators. And as Ariel pointed out, like uh, in the stories of those who kind of left the field or don't want to stay in the field, we learn a lot about what we call structural inhibitors, characteristics of the work that really drive people away. Now, if you are armed with, maybe that's the wrong metaphor, if you're blessed with uh, strong relationships with fellow Jewish educators, you're more likely to stay in the field. Those relationships can sustain you through difficult moments. And enabling opportunities build such relationships with peers and with mentors. That's the way they make a difference to people's trajectories. So let me just move finally to a, a last kind of summary slide here uh, and kind of read you through what's here. 
What we notice is that despite the fragmented field, and Ariel began by characterizing the field as highly fragmented and kind of uneven, uneven, despite the unevenness and the fragmented nature of that landscape, Jewish educators are motivated by a shared mission or a common calling that really jumps out from our data. The sense of mission distinguishes educators from those who have never worked in the field, and even more so from those who once started work as Jewish educators and then left. Like lacking that mission to a large degree accounts for why people say, I've had enough, I wanna leave. Mission is a key element in resisting the structural inhibitors that drive people away from the field, as something just mentioned before. We suggest that to improve rates of educator retention, it's vital to help those who enter the field because the opportunity was available, I mentioned those folks earlier, that they have, a vocation, they have occasions to find such a personal sense of mission themselves. Mission can indeed be cultivated and sustained. It's not all or nothing. There are many other implications of the study, more than happy to talk about those in the Q&A, but hopefully this gives people enough to um, uh, sink their teeth into. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna take the opportunity just to um, share the first uh, couple of questions that came into the chat and then uh, we'll, we'll pick it back up. So first uh, from Hannah, is there any data, sorry, is there any data on the enabling experiences at mid-level or career shifts? For example, not as pre-service, but as promotional opportunities present? That's question one and question two. Do we have any information on the numbers of how many participants in enabling opportunities go on to work and then careers in Jewish education? Well, I'm, Ariel, I'm happy to, to go with that. Um, so the career shifters are really interesting because in functional terms, their early careers may be equivalent to a fair degree to what enabling opportunities accomplish. They build professional resilience, they build professional skills, maturity to some degree. And those who enter the field are often kind of inspired in, in the ways that enabling opportunities inspire others. So what, we're, what we don't tend to see is that those, those folks who shift career do not tend to pass through those environments and they don't necessarily um, suffer as a consequence, let me say that. Uh, secondly, in terms of what proportion of those who experience these programs go into the field, that is a kind of black box question. The data is really opaque uh, about how many folks are actually in these programs all told at any one time. We have some numbers, but the, the ways in which organization report, organizations report those numbers is quite inconsistent. And I think that is something that still really needs to be established for the field. Okay, um, a couple of questions um, moving forward. Is there any data on particular characteristics of successful enabling opportunities or do they all work well as long as they build skills, cap cultural capital and relationships? That's one and two, is there any data on the degree of the relationships and the impact, meaning educators and positive relationships with, other, with others within their specific workplace versus relationships with other educators in the field broadly? So I would, I mean, in terms of that first part of that question about the data on particular characteristics, so, I mean, I do, I do want to say like we were not comparing enabling opportunities against one another. So that's important to understand just about the kind of analysis that we did. Um, but we do know in general education research about what um, components are of um, teacher pre-service learning that's associated with better outcomes and also in-service uh, teacher professional learning associated with higher outcomes as well. So we do have some fairly good ideas, at least for in terms of on the pre-service side of things, what some of those components might be um, in terms of um, what, what the curriculum could look like and also um, having those, um, you know, those structured um, apprenticeships, um, those kind of field work opportunities um, under the guidance of a, of a mentor are, are also um, 
those are that's an evidence-based practice in uh, teacher education that's um, associated with uh, with better outcomes. I mean, if I jumping in and connecting this element of the work with a later element of the work, um, here's one of the real frustrations is that what we learn from the mapping the market strand of our work is that market forces are essentially eroding the appeal of those enabling opportunities, both to employers and to employees. Our employers will tell you, you can come and take a job with me without having to having been through one of those programs. And uh, those coming into the field see that themselves. And they also see how much, how costly these programs are. And the financial calculus is such that it, it's just not worth paying the money if I can get a job anyway. So, you know, one of our thoughts in terms of, and this goes back to the question that Rachel Abrahams raised right at the beginning of the session in response to Manny's invitation is that in many ways, it may be that enabling opportunities would be more appealing and more effective if they weren't strictly speaking pre-service experiences, but if they were experiences that are offered to people maybe more than one or two years in, still within those first five years of work in the field, but after people have, have dipped their toe in the water, maybe had some kind of induction experience. And once those folks have a taste for the field, they may be much more receptive to the opportunities provided by these frameworks and propelled much further forward by participating in these things. In the realm of uh, career ladders, what, what do we know from the study about um, effective or appropriate career ladders often suggested from, uh, from Arnie, often the only career ladder is to go from the classroom to administration. Of course, that's within the day school space um, and this might not lead to a successful path of development. So what, what would you say uh, based on that? Um, so I would say, first of all, uh, and Alice, you can jump into, but that is actually something that is touched on explicitly in the context of our next webinar, which will be looking more at, um, uh, it's coming from the on the journey segment of the study, right? So it's looking at people who are already five or more years into their career and um, what are some of the factors that induce them to stay or to leave the field as they proceed in, in their career. Um, so we do have a lot to say about career ladders and um, like spoiler alert, like kind of for the most part, the, as, as is alluded to in um, Arnie's um, uh, chat here, right, the, the absence of them, the absence of what we call teacher leader positions in general education, um, that um, we just don't have an infrastructure that supports that, generally speaking, in general education. So we'll talk more about that the next time we meet, um, but Alex, perhaps you want to add something as well. Yeah, I mean, this, like, this is really a, a kind of ultimate question, right? And um, you know, what we learn from, uh, as Ariel said, from other parts of our study is just how critical professional development is and making opportunities for professional development available to educators are uh, in uh, stimulating their appetite to remain. Uh, it may not be so much about uh, advancing to another level or acquiring a different status in the field, but it, it could be just as much about deepening and intensifying the meaning of the work and enabling people to feel appreciated in that work. What we found in the, in the, in the other strand of the study, I don't wanna take up time on this because you can come back in a few weeks time, is, um, is that people don't typically leave the field once they've made a start because of the salary, once they're more than five years in. Uh, there are other factors that drive them away. They know about the levels of pay coming in. They would appreciate being paid more but it isn't that they would leave because they aren't able to earn more and they have to go into administration because that's the only way of learning more. It seems to be about a wider range of factors that encourage people to remain and develop as Jewish educators in the field. You know, Ar Arnie asked about the classroom and certainly once upon a time, the classic Jewish educator was the day school educator or the classroom educator. What does this field 
how, how does this study rather help us think differently about Jewish educators or more broadly, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think like uh, to go back to something that Ariel began with is that, you know, uh, a priori, we began with a, an expectation that Jewish education takes place in many more settings than classrooms, however conceived. And I think one of the most exciting uh, findings in, in our work is that no matter where people uh, do the work of Jewish education, they do share a similar passion, sense of mission, altruistic drive to contribute. Nevertheless, the nature of that work seems to us to be increasingly different. Kind of talk about uh, the, the, the fracturing of, the, of various continents on which Jewish education is situated. Uh, the experience of working in this field is very different if you're in the engagement, if you're in an innovation sector than it is in the more connect conventional sectors. So it, it, it's, it, on the one hand, we can still talk about a Jewish educator and, and this experience. And on the other hand, we may need to use different terms to describe this work when conducted in the widest variety of settings in which it takes place. Great, thank you. Ariel, um, you know, just kind of in reflection of your presentation, yours and Alex's presentation, um, and given the context in which we're having this conversation today, um, I'd like to ask two questions. First, why is this conversation around the pipeline um, into Jewish education important for between CASG and this audience, this audience of Jewish funders? Um, and second, um, we'd love to know, I'd love to know, and I imagine others as well, what is CASG doing with this research and within the broader field of Jewish education and Jewish communal life? Okay, so thank you for those questions, Andy. So I think the first thing I would say just as an overarching frame is that um, at CASG, we care about um, good, good data, right? Good research, but also good use of research um, just as much. Um, and generally speaking, in the field of Jewish education, we do look to general education as a useful model. Um, but um, when it comes to disseminating research-based evidence, that's where sometimes you, you notice like a pretty abrupt disjuncture between what the field of general education and Jewish education looks like. Um, so um, in general education, um, there's actually like a pretty large audience of consumers of research-based knowledge in the form of um, policymakers, right? So there are people making decisions. It could be like a, at a local level, at a district level, um, uh, at a at a. I think I'm having a mic issue. Hang on one second. Uh, at a state, um, at a at the state or even the national level, um, right? So, but there are people who are actually using the research. Um, we may quibble about how well they're using it, but they're using you know, research-based evidence and other forms of evidence, of course, to frame plans of action and to set policy. So we, we really just don't have this whole sort of body of, um, of, of, of work in Jewish education, right? So of course the state has some say and some influence over things like accreditation or you know workplace environment or working with children but there's no there's no policy making agency saying this is what your curriculum must look like or this is how we are going to assess a teacher's effectiveness right we don't have that at all um, we have umbrella organizations like um, prisma for example right they're champions of a sector they are thought leaders but they don't have authority per se so in terms of who there is who may be a consumer of our of research, right, and has the power to affect change and launch interventions, that's often uh, the funding community. Um, whether or not, you know, that professional group plays this role consciously or unconsciously, right? Funders, grant making professionals are critical consumers of research based evidence, and they have the capacity to act on that knowledge and use it to frame plans of action that um, do wield influence. Um, so that's a reason why we're very excited to engage with the Jewish Funders Network um, as one of the professional communities we're working with. 
Um, although most of our work is disseminating uh, the findings with practitioner organizations. Um, again, right, our mission is not just about good research, it's about um, increasing the capacity of the field to be good consumers of and users of research. Um, so um, we're trying to get uh, research based evidence into the hands of people who can put it to good use. Um, and so we really co design with practitioners with practitioner leaders, um, facilitated workshops, working groups right now, um, to help them unpack these data, right, and to work collaboratively with them to use the data to frame actionable ideas. So in addition to um, working with the Jewish funders network, we do work with um, Prisma Foundation for Jewish camp. Um, JPRO with um, with all, pretty much all of the educational leaders from the major US metropolitan areas and federations and central agencies. Um, and these are ongoing programs um, that we really hope will culminate in actionable and if I may say fundable ideas for the field. It, it, you know, I, I, it might be for later because um, I don't know if this question is just for you, um, and maybe this question, maybe everyone on this call would be, you know, positioned to answer it, but I do wonder uh, what each of you think about whether or not the Jewish educational ecosystem, you know, currently in place is designed to empower that kind of intervention, you know, based on those, those uh, institutions that you mentioned and beyond, um, but perhaps for later. Uh, but if, if you'll permit, I have a question for you, Manny, if that's okay. All right. So um, you and also Stacey Turner, who I believe is out there on this uh, webinar as well. But, um, you know, you've really been ongoing thought partners and leaders of this project over the last few years. Um, so I'm really curious how you and your colleagues are thinking about how these findings will impact how you do your work. You know, how is the Davidson Foundation? Um, using the research in any internal conversations that you may be having, if you can yeah. share a little bit about that. Uh, sure, sure. I, you know, there's a lot in this CASG research. Um, of course, today we're just touching on one of the various strands, um, and we're still reviewing the findings, and um, we're reviewing the findings with our board and other stakeholders, and considering how we can and should best incorporate it into you know, our support for Jewish educators. One, I'll say, um, A, we're grateful for this resource. We believe it's invaluable to help us consider our strategy and design a plan. Um, two, we're deeply engaged in understanding our home community so we can make some sustainable change. Um, you know, look, it's clear to us, and this, this is an ongoing conversation that we have that thanks to the research is, is more intensive right now, but it's clear that Jewish educators need greater pathways, greater opportunities for development and greater respect. Um, we are eager to be in conversation with the rest of the uh, funding community to hear how others have intervened and are intervening, what's working and what's not, uh, to be able to think about how you know, that might impact our design. Um, it's early for us. Um, I will share one brief anecdote. Um, I wouldn't say this is a strategy, but I would say it gives us some sense of how strategies can, can you know, how we might think about our relationship to a strategy, an emergent strategy. Um, the William Davidson Foundation uh, recently partnered with the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Detroit um, to ensure that every individual working in a Jewish day school in Metro Detroit during the pandemic, whether a uh, day school that we support or not, um, and whether classroom teacher or administrator or not, uh, would be invited to a catered um, meal, a catered breakfast or brunch, and given um, $200 gift cards. Um, those gift cards obviously are not um, going to change the lives um, and even the financial positions of our educators. But um, it was meant to say thank you and a recognition of 
the hard work, the extra hard work that it that was involved in being in a day school during the pandemic, the stress, the challenge, the anxiety, and the time and the effort. Um, and what's remarkable is the reaction that we had from our day school uh, professionals, um, educators crying when they were when they received the gift cards, um, running after staff of the foundation and the federation in the parking lot to say thank you, to express appreciation, um, really expressing this sense of feeling seen, feeling heard, being recognized and being appreciated. And so I would say it, it's, it's an anecdote that layered onto what you shared with us and what the, the research is, is communicating just points to how much, um, you know, how desperate um, the, the workforce is for some added something, whether it's appreciation or acknowledgement or, um, per, you know, I I involvement. And, um, and, and there's more to be done and, and we want to continue learning, uh, but, but, but we're excited and hopeful and eager to, to get it started and, and really to be part of the conversation um, with, the, with the rest of the, um, the funding community. Um, on that note, I will, um, I'm going to ask Tamar if it's okay with you. Uh, you might not be um, on video, but we're going to invite all the, everyone in the audience to join the screen uh, so that we can have an open conversation. And if you prefer not to be um, on screen, um, we are going to, you can turn your screen off. Um, but if you're willing to and open to, we think this point might be uh, really opportune for a broader collective conversation. So thank you, Arnie, for being our first to, uh, to join us, but really everyone. And hello, Gary. It's nice to see you too. And you can mute, you can unmute. Uh, this is really going to be an opportunity for an open discussion, a uh, conversation uh, between, you know, one another. Uh, we have, you know, the, the um, wisdom of Ariel and Alex with us, um, but this is also an opportunity for us to be in conversation with one another. If you have further questions, if you wanna ask one another, if, uh, if um, frankly, Perhaps Ariel, you have questions for others on this uh, on this call. So I'll just say I was about to type in the chat, Manny, not knowing that you were going to invite us to join. Um, that perhaps when the series is done, right, there might be a reason or room for funders who are interested to talk to each other about kind of what our thoughts you know, post of the learning are, right? Whether sharing things that we are doing or things that this causes us to think about. I think Great. so often kind of we get off these webinars and everyone is then again, like left to their own, you know. Yeah, that's uh, a great idea. Right, but, but if we could talk about kind of, again, not after we've done the learning, I think mm -hmm. together, um, you know, what, what does it make us think about? What are possibilities? Great, great, that would be wonderful. Um, I know that pre-COVID, some of us were <laughs> discussing some of those ideas. Stacy, I saw that you posted something in the chat. I don't know if you want to uh, offer it uh, verbally. Um, sure. I mean, I was just so, sort of saying the same as you that we're, I mean, there's a lot <laughs> to digest. And I think our team is um, trying to do that. You, you can't just sit down and, and read it and automatically know everything and know what to do. Um, so we're eager to be in conversation with, you know, grantees and the field and other funders about um, next step and uh, next steps in the applicability. Um, I mean, I, I think you can't read this part of the report and not just be completely alarmed by the compensation and benefits issue. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know what to say about that. Our, our, our you know, We've had conversations about, you know, what could one foundation do about that if we if that was the thing we wanted to take on. Um, I mean, it is sort of 
shameful that we expect our educators to operate in conditions like that. And I, I, you know, I'm just speaking completely transparently, like, what do we do about that? <laughs> um, if anything, what can we do? And I, I know our board, when they heard um, this part of the findings, wanted to try to understand, is it, is Jewish education, is that, is it the same in public education? Like, is it just an educator issue? Um, not that we should be okay with it if it's if it's the same for public educators, but um, you know I think that's that little bit of nuance um, was one of the questions our board had. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then the other part is it was I said was so inspiring is we have educators out there who are driven by this sense of mission and wanting to do for other people and. How do we capitalize on that? How do we foster that? How do we, you know, spark that? Um, are are things that we're thinking about? We're we're definitely um, thinking about things around um, Alex's point about, you know, are there other opportunities to support educators, you know, one or two years in to their careers? Like, is that sort of a good lever, a good moment in time uh, where we could? Um, invest in some opportunities that might reap some benefits that um, aren't there right now. Um, so that's, I didn't also did not realize I'd be called on. So I, that's the top well, of my know, head ramblings. <laughs> Stacey, I, I um, it's, you know, it's been a few years of our back and forth around this. I'll just mention, you talked about general education. I remember early, early on, Alex, you and I had a conversation about the pipeline and I said something about like, why are we thinking about sunsetting out? Why are, and, and you explained there's, there can only be a healthy pipeline if, if, if we know where folks can go. And you know, in general education, folks go into the public schools and they know what the opportunity is after their service. In Jewish education, we don't have that kind of a design um, where educators are supported post and have an incentive perhaps to allow others to step in. Um, Amanda, um, I know that um, in Atlanta, there's been some, some intervention around some of this topic. Maybe perhaps you'd be willing to talk about it. Sure, um, and I have just some questions too, so I'll throw those out at the end. So um, you, I think partly to address this issue of um, benefits and also just like Kavod and elevating the stature of the of the field. Um, the Zalex introduced a pilot this year. I'm sure most of you have, have heard of it. Um, it was a it was a pilot to offer half off tuition to an accredited Jewish high school to the child of any full time Jewish professional. So this was launched relatively late in the year in March, and in Atlanta, most people are re-enrolling and making decisions about school in April because our school years end in, in uh, May. But it was really a three-tiered um, strategy to show appreciation. And I think it's been successful on that. I mean, the the emails, the notes, the, the people who have reached out saying like, we were never thought of, no one ever recognized us. Or like one of the things we heard from people was, I'm a VP or I'm a senior rabbi. And so people never felt like I should should, should um, receive this type of a discount. And it was very uncomfortable and invasive to put forth my financials and my personal situation. And then we had, one of the things that was really interesting is a number of Jewish early childhood teachers who qualified. And we even heard a couple of episodic instances of people who became preschool teachers, like people who were in their mid forties who said, you know what, for this, I'm going back and I'm gonna go teach preschool. Um, but again, I, I, it's, it's episodic, but what we haven't seen is an actual shift in enrollment. I think it's just too early given the timing of when it was launched. So I think to be told, um, but you know, this is the kind of thing that in one community is not going to certainly change the field, but if there was a movement around the country to try and offer this type of, um, benefit, to educators and communal professionals, you know, that starts to have potentially some impact. So happy to share more. 
um, as we as we learn more. But one of the questions that I had um, is, you know, related to this issue of people who are beyond the five years who've been in the field and like to what extent when people start to reach that mark, do they leave because they see what I'm so passionate about, what's been this driving force, I'm not even going to be able to access for my family. And so if I'm doing this to, to give an education to others and I can't access it for my own, at what point is it not worth it? And just the scale tip. And then there's also, there's an article, I don't know if um, Manny or Alex or um, Ariel, if you've seen it, but it came out in um, Chronicle of Philanthropy a couple, maybe a month and a half ago. And it was talking about how there's been a shift since the pandemic in people who were going into the nonprofit world. And like for the past 20 years, it was very much driven by this cause, like a, an inner cause to give back. And, and that's what was highlighted in your findings. But what they found in the last six months is that is no longer a motivator. And instead, young people are saying that they will give back by volunteering their time and that because of the, the salaries and the um, work-life balance in nonprofits and the churn, it's not worth it. And so I think it's a cautionary finding for us to be aware of on educators because this data was all gathered pre-pandemic. So I wonder if that intrinsic fire that has driven so many people up to this point may be less of a factor moving forward and people just may be more practical. Yeah, that's right. Really... I know we have to close out. I'll just just say so. Thank you so much for those questions. We will have another report actually that's coming out shortly that will kind of take a little bit more of a, the COVID perspective, um, because you're right that the bulk of the data we're reporting on was sort of collected either before or in the early months, and so that will kind of orient us a little bit better to some of the early impacts from. We're not post COVID yet, but you know, later, later stage, I hope COVID, thanks. Great, thank you. All right, well, I wanna say thank you to everybody. We are a few moments over and I wanna um, respect everybody's time, but it's great to see this conversation continuing. And I wanna, I wanna thank Ariel, Manny and Alex for, for joining us today and presenting all of these findings so that we can really see what we can do with it in the funders community. Uh, this was one of three. So the second one is on Monday, November 15th from 1230 to 145 Eastern Standard Time. I put um, a, a, the link in, in the chat for everybody to register for that. I'll also send out reminder emails and make sure that you all have that. So to be continued, and I and Rachel, thank you so much for that idea of coming together maybe after these three. So I'm gonna work on that to try to see how we can have that session of just really open time and conversation just like this that can be so rich after we, we dive into all of that. So to be continued and thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>